Tonight we have Paul Patton. He's an assistant professor in sociology and anthropology and food studies. I got it all. Uh, and he's presenting today, if you didn't know, the president has announced that all days this week have a theme. Tonight's theme is legacy. And we just happen to have a speaker tonight talking about the legacy of food here in Ohio. So, Paul, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I'm really excited to be here. This is the first Science Cafe I've ever done, so i um, pretty excited for, for that opportunity. So I appreciate everyone who helped to put this together. Tonight what I'm going to talk about, as, as Sarah was mentioning, is, is legacy, particularly the legacy of a number of Appalachian crops uh, that were domesticated here thousands of years ago and sustained the prehistoric populations that once lived here in this valley and the surrounding areas. Uh, most of them you will not be familiar with. Um, most of them, honestly, you've probably never heard of. Uh, and, and most of you, if you do any kind of gardening, probably take every opportunity to rip them out of your gardens as possible. Um, and we're going to talk about why you probably do that, but then also why maybe you should reconsider doing that. Okay, so um, if you bear with me a little bit, um, I want to start by kind of laying out um, a little bit of history here. Um, again, that legacy connection. Um, how many people have been up to Hocking Hills before? Yeah, hiked Hocking Hills. How many people in particular have been to Ash Cave? Yeah, pretty cool place to go. If you haven't been there, get an op take an opportunity, go up. It's, it's probably, what, a 45 minute drive up to Ash Cave uh, from OU campus. You can take Union Street, literally all the way there, uh, windy roads the whole way, and eventually you'll see the big sign that says Ash Cave on your right, and you can pull over and you can hike out to the cave. And it's really just a large rock shelter. It's a rock overhang from sandstone that was formed um, when, when glaciers melted and, and chewed away at some of the materials uh, that were underlying that sandstone. Uh, but what's really significant about Ash Cave is not necessarily, well, I'm not a geologist, I'm sure geologists would disagree with me, but what I don't find to be so important about Ash Cave is the geology, but instead the archaeology. And that is to say that in, in 1876, a very, very long time ago, right, over 100 years ago, uh, a man by the name of Eb Ebenezer Baldwin Andrews, he was a geologist, um, was coming through the region and he decided to excavate Ash Cave and he dug a big trench down the middle of it, up to the back wall. And what he found inside, that, inside of that trench that he had dug uh, was a, a bag of seeds, cashed up, stored against the back wall. And he, he, he sent those to a friend of his, Asa Gray, over at the Peabody Museum, and he said, can you identify what kinds of seeds these are? And, and Gray looked at him and he came back to him and he said, yeah, this, these are Kinopodium album seeds. Uh, this, is a particular, this is a particular genus of plants that we commonly refer to as, as goosefoot or lamb's quarters. Uh, it turns out Asa Gray was wrong. It was not Kinopodium album. Kinopodium album is native to Europe, not to Eastern North America. It was actually a species that we refer to today as Kinopodium berlandieri. Uh, what was really significant about these seeds they sat on a shelf for over 100 years, and no one even acknowledged they were there, uh, until about 1985 when someone started going through them again. And at that point in time, we had radiocarbon dating, and so some of those seeds could be directly dated. And we found out they were over 2,000 years old. What was really cool about those seeds, though, was they were unlike wild Kinopodium berlandieri. What do I mean by that? This is a wild Kinopodium berlandieri. Goosefoot, lamb's quarter. Like I said, you guys probably have this in your garden. You probably rip it out. Uh, the, the leaves are very edible. Um, maybe you snack on them occasionally. Uh, farmers actually complain frequently about how this wonderful plant comes into their, their fields and they have to spray herbicide to kill it off because it will overtake their corn. Um, we'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. But what was really cool about these seeds uh, that, that Andrews had found, wild seeds, if you look at them in profile, look kind of like this. These seeds look like little hamburgers, kind of, right, in profile. The other thing about these seeds that was really interesting is that when they looked at the seed coats themselves, they were very, very small. 
Uh, they were under what we call, tw they were under a measurement 20 microns. In the wild, these seeds, their seed coats are always over 40 microns, so they had been cut in half. Um, these were indicators that these plants were not wild plants, that they in fact had undergone a process of domestication, that humans had, had basically created this variety of the plant. Now, how did they do that? That's kind of the area in which I work, is understanding domestication, how people in the past altered wild plants and animals uh, to make them into something that we can utilize today. How many of you, I'm sure all of you, have had corn on the cob at this point in the year, yeah? Corn, corn derives from a plant that the cobs in the wild are teeny tiny little things. Or here's this one, and I'll pass this around in case you're interested. Any guesses as to what this is? Or what you would recognize it as? Nope, not a potato. It's hard. It's a, it's a squash. Uh, anyone carving jack-o'-lanterns for October? Here's its wild progenitor. This is what jack-o'-lanterns were domesticated from. This little thing. Also, your, your zucchini, your summer squash, they all come from this wild plant. So, so just as an indicator, humans have done some pretty amazing things with wild plants and animals and turned them into things today that if I were to hand that to you and ask you what in the world you use today that, that this is very closely related to, I, I wager to bet the last thing you were going to think of was a pumpkin, right? Here's another great example of domestication. These guys, if you, were to, if you, if you did not know what you were looking at and I said, Tell me what species of animals you think these are, and I'll hold them up in just a moment. Let's start with this one. Yeah? Any guesses? Anyone seen this guy before? It's a coyote. It's a coyote, right? Really closely related to the wolf, to the point that in some instances they can uh, crossbreed with one another. Yeah. What's that? A bobcat? Nope, not a bobcat. Though I should have brought the bobcat. This is a dog. Really large dog. And so is this. Right? And this thing that looks kind of like a horseshoe crab when you hold it up this way. So is it. This is a French, French bulldog. Uh, I'm inclined to think this is probably something comparable to, I think, a Labrador Retriever, probably. And then this is the wonderful little Pomeranian, right? So human beings, human beings bred and selected for different characteristics in the wolf to create those three. This is our closest thing here in the wild today uh, related to them, just to give you an idea of scale. There's some really cool characteristics, of course, that we can look at here and we can say, this is a wild one. They tend to have really long, narrow noses, right? One of the things that humans select for and almost all of the others is the reduced snout. Why the reduced snout? It turns out that the genes that are connected to uh, basically characteristics that we refer to as neotenous characteristics or childlike characteristics actually are also uh, linked to aggressive behaviors. So in the instance that humans began selecting for wolves that were really more kind or nicer or more cuddly, um, they ultimately were altering the animals themselves. And then once they had produced a breed or a variety that they could get along with in their villages, then they started getting things like spots and waggy tails and different sizes of snouts. And they started selecting in different ways for this. Um, so what we're talking about here is what we refer to as artificial selection or domestication. And really, that term has a particular meaning. It's basically to create something uh, that doesn't exist in nature and thus is completely reliant upon human beings for its survival. So how many people, I'm sure most of you have dogs at home, yeah? yeah? Cats? They're the one thing I haven't figured out whether or not they're actually domesticated or not, right? <laughs> now, turn, turns out, actually, cats um, seem to be extremely domesticated, some of the new data suggesting, um, despite the fact that uh, physically they look much like their wild relatives. <coughs> so getting back to the kinopods that I was mentioning before, um, and the Hocking Hills area, this goosefoot plant, this is um, actually same plant, same species of plant, right? Kinopodium berlandieri, wild, 
This is a cultivar that comes from Mesoamerica, same species, very different, right? You can see that there's something really distinct about these two. If you came across them in the wild, you would say these are not the same species of plant. What is it that humans did here, of course? They increased uh, the inflorescence and located it on the primary stem. Uh, we see a reddish color that does tend to pop up with this particular species, um, and most of them in this genus. Um, and, and again, these seeds are much bigger, and they've got that hamburger shape and those real thin seed coats, okay? But so this is Kenopodium berlandieri, and I'm not here. Let's uh, pass these around so you guys can get a feel for the differences between them. So this plant in southeastern Ohio, is for the, the earliest evidence we have of it actually comes from Illinois um, in, in a site referred to as the Riverton site, and it dates to about 3,800 years ago is the first time we see these domesticated seeds of this kenopod, uh, or goosefoot, or lamb's quarters, uh, was about 3,800 years ago. But that wasn't the only plant that was a native plant that was being domesticated by prehistoric people living in the area. This is very sad looking. I broke the arch on top here of this inflorescence. Here's another one that I guarantee you probably have never heard of. The scientific name is Iva annua. Okay, um, the common name for it is marsh elder or sumpweed. Um, it has a really distinct odor to it. Um, I have a friend that actually raises this and she sets her fields on fire at the end of each each year and she said that it smells like someone has just started smoking a whole lot of marijuana in the field. Uh, it has a really distinct odor and um, we, I was out last week doing a survey looking for this crop or this plant and we stepped on some and, and immediately smelled that smell and knew it had to be around somewhere. Uh, but so this is another one and what's really interesting about this, it's a little bit different. It has these really cool seeds and I'll pass a little vial of seeds around. Um, they have a kind of a weird shape to them. And in the case of this particular seed, what we see happen during domestication is it gets much larger, much wider, and turns kind of boxy looking, right? Um, so we can actually look at measurements here and, and see that this plant was domesticated. Again, it comes from the Mississippi River Valley. It makes its way up north. Uh, so this Iva annua here. So we've got kenopods, we've got Iva annua. We've got that little pumpkin that I'm passing around. It's called Cucurbita pipo is its scientific name. It's a squash, a pipo squash. Um, and so that's another one of these foods that was domesticated about 5,000 years ago. So we're starting, to, we're starting to run through some of these plants, of course, uh, that were really important. Now, if I were to ask you what, what is the traditional Native American diet, what are you guys going to say? Maize, corn, beans, squash, right? And of course, those don't actually come into our area until, well, maize doesn't really make it in until firmly being grown about 1,100 years ago. Okay, so we're talking about a subsistence, a food system that existed for thousands of years prior to that. At the point where we start to see the domestication of these plants, we also see some major changes in the archaeological record. And one of the things I want to pass around, uh, as long as no one drops them, they're pretty, they're pretty hardy, uh, but don't drop them because they may shatter, um, is some differences in some of the tools and the artifacts that we see um, at about the same time. So these are, um, these are actually real artifacts. I, I have a count on them, so no one's allowed to leave the room right, until they all return. Um, but so these were found in a storage pit, uh, not very far from here, actually. Pass um, this way. So these were found in a large storage pit with, um, actually, there was a nice pottery vase below it. This is the rim of that. It is aged and broken apart and much too fragile to pass around, unfortunately. It doesn't look like much, right? It just looks like a, a little bit of, of mud slapped together here. But this is actually an old earthen jar. Um, this is the rim of that. What you're seeing here is a neck. It would have flared out at the base. Um, these these uh, tools that I just passed around, they're made of an, a local chert or flint material. Uh, those were actually stored inside of this. Uh, they may have had handles uh, that they were tied onto. And then below this bag, we excavated this site uh, last year and this, and this summer, uh, below this, this, in this pit that we found, was a whole bunch of these guys. 
And some of the, these, these marsh elder or sumpweed plants, we dated it, guess what? It turns out to be about 2,000 years old, the same time as that ash cave collection. What's really interesting is this period in time, we're starting to see more and more of these storage pits. This is a period in time we refer to as, in archeology span as the Middle Woodland period. Okay, and the Middle Woodland period, um, if you're familiar with Ohio archeology, span you probably are familiar with the Hopewell, right? Or you've heard the word Hopewell before, uh, referring to those people that build large, Geometric mound centers, right? Um, here's a little secret about the Hopewell. The Hopewell were not a tribe of people, okay? I get that a lot. Uh, they, it's actually a name that white people call them. We have no idea what these people called themselves. But we know there are certain cultural characteristics about them. They build really large mound centers. And for a while, we assumed that they were farming corn. Turns out they weren't, right? No corn was here yet. Um, they're producing pottery, they're producing houses. Uh, the houses they're producing are rectangular structures and they're living on their landscape and they're staying put in a location. Okay, so we, we have these people then that are actually, in a sense, the first farmers of southeastern Ohio. We can confirm that from Ash Cave, we can confirm that from sites like this one that we're passing around the artifacts to, uh, referred to as Greendale Ridgetop site. Um, they engaged in making artwork, right? Uh, this comes from a site that actually is up near Nelsonville. Um, if anyone's ever been to the Nelsonville um, football stadium, right, right behind the high school, um, there was a small uh, house that was excavated from the time period that we're referring to here, that middle woodland. This is actually a pendant that probably would have been worn around the neck. Um, I will pass this around in a box so that if it does drop it doesn't shatter everywhere but take a look at it because you can see uh, some of the engravings that were made on that so that there's almost a uh, like two little bracelets cutting down and then some rings coming off from it yeah Would those engravings have been decorative? they appear to be decorative they may have been symbolic they may have meant something most likely meant something to the people that carved them on there uh, it's hard to say but if you look real closely you can see there does seem to be almost a circular pattern in the center of it and then almost I mean, and, and granted, I'm putting my own interpretation on this, almost rays coming off from it, perhaps the sun, perhaps. Uh, it's, it's hard to say, and they're very, they're very finely etched in there, and it's hard to, to tell exactly what the intention was. But so we have these farming communities by the Middle Woodland period, and then recently we've been doing a lot of data collection and looking at sites that are slightly older. So anyone, again, going back to our dogs here, anyone ever been out to the Athens County Dog Shelter? Yeah? Anyone? A whole lot more people probably should go visit the Athens County Dog Shelter, right? Uh, they're always looking for homes for their pups, and now you can, can take your, your pick of which size you want, right, and understand that it's just a little wolf in disguise. Um, but, but in seriousness, the Athens County Dog Shelter actually sits on an archaeological site that was excavated many years ago. Uh, and that site is much, much older than the sites that we've so far been talking about. The site dates to about 3,000 to 4,000 years ago. And what's interesting about that particular site is there are a number of pits at that location that were excavated, and lo and behold, these domesticated plants are inside of it. Okay, so we excavated plants out of there that are over 3,000 years old. And so these are some pushing back this farming technology even further in time. So one of the things that, that I often talk about when I talk about archaeology and, and food systems in the past is I talk about issues of, of, of our local community, right? Uh, because I think these things are really, really related and, and correlate well with one another. Uh, how many people are familiar that in Athens County, uh, the poverty rate is 31.9%? Yeah? One of the highest, it may be the highest in the state of Ohio. Meigs County, 21.9 percent, just over, just over the county line. Vinton County, 20.6 uh, percent of people are living in poverty. We start looking at other questions, food insecurity, right? Uh, which is an area that I find to be really important. Um, there, I think the, the newest statistics suggest that one in four children in Athens County go to school hungry, right? and not getting enough sustenance. And a lot of this has to do uh, with questions of nutrition. What are the diets that we're eating, right? It just so happens that the, 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 less, or the least uh, nutritional foods are also some of the cheapest foods, right? Uh, so there's nutritional quality questions. There's also a question of, of socioeconomic status and, and access to resources within our community. And that may seem like a fast forward when we're talking about prehistoric populations, but those plants that I'm passing around to you have some really interesting characteristics to them, 
So that Kinopodium berlandieri that I just passed around, the amount of protein in it, it is about 19.12% protein, 47.55% carbohydrate, and 28% fiber. Compare that to corn, which is 8.9% protein, 70.2% carbohydrates, right? And 2% fiber. Or even a better food than corn, right? Beans, 22% protein, 60% carbohydrates, and 4.3% fiber. So those, those kinopods that are passing around, that goose foot actually has more nutrition in it than any of the foods that we're now shooting with herbicides or, or protecting with herbicides from the quinopods, right? Kind of interesting. Uh, how many people are familiar with the, the great food quinoa, right? That wonderful nutritional food. Yeah, comes from the Andes, right? Bolivia. We can talk later about the, the carbon footprint every time you take a big mouthful of it. That's a whole nother conversation, right? Um, so let me tell you what the genus of that species is. Quinopodium quinoa. Actually, the new data indicates that that plant I've been passing around, that Quinopodium berlandieri, is actually the progenitor of quinoa. That is to say that it is the plant from which quinoa was domesticated. In the Andes, they did something different with it. Not all that different from, from this, actually. If I actually put uh, some of the, the seeds of that berlandieri that have been cult the cultivated variety, and I didn't bring them, I'm sorry, next to quinoa seeds, I would guarantee you probably couldn't choose which one was which. Right? They're identical in that respect, except that this berlandieri has a little better nutrition, more protein, more fiber, less carbohydrates. Uh, so, when we, so when we think in terms of uh, <coughs> issues of food insecurity in our area, uh, this is something I, I encourage folks to consider. Native food that was utilized by people for thousands of years here, um, perhaps the legacy of that food could help us to deal with some of our issues of food insecurity and poverty in our region today. And so what we've been doing in the last few years is we've actually been doing growing experiments out at the Ohio University Plant Biology uh, Research Gardens. Um, and we have some data on returns of these things. So our preliminary yields have indicated that on an acre of land, on an acre of land, with the cultivated varieties of Quinopodium berlandieri, we can produce about 2,780 pounds of food per acre. That's on the low end. Compare that to quinoa, for example, that's grown in Peru, you're looking at 1,025 pounds per acre. Or even at its height, quinoa from the Bolivian mountains, you're looking at about 13,000, I'm sorry, 1,338 uh, pounds per acre. So, so we can produce more with this native food in our own environment than we can, than, than what can be produced of quinoa in Bolivia, the, the heartland of quinoa. And then we don't have to be, be so guilty over that carbon footprint. We're getting better nutrition. And here's the best part. Here's the best part. If we take the price, if we take the market prices for quinoa per pound, it sells at about $3.40 per pound quinoa in the market. So if we think about that per acre then, and I, and I ran these numbers today and double checked them, on the low end, our Berlandieri per acre would produce about $9,452 versus an acre of corn that produces about $880 per acre. Or an acre of soy that only produces about $1,704 per acre. So when we talk about poverty, when we talk about food, when we talk about nutrition, food insecurity, I think that there's a great lesson to be learned from the past in particular and the legacy of that past. Yeah. Okay, to me the important question. How does it taste? Tastes just like quinoa. Tastes just like quinoa. Yep. How much harder is it to process? So one of the things that we've been struggling with is the issue of processing, right? Um, so with the cultivated varieties, uh, particularly from Mesoamerica, and we've been working with those cultivated varieties to try to cross pollinate those with our native wild varieties so that we have some of the resilience of that local native crop combined then with some of the traits like these domesticated traits that we really want uh, that make it easier. Uh, the processing is, the consequence of that is the seed is slightly smaller, not all that much, maybe a fraction of a, of a millimeter smaller. Um, and with the wild variety, you do have a harder shell, which means that you've got to crack through that. 
One of the ways that you can do that is actually by popping it. Okay, uh, so one of the things that's been done is, is popping it, basically a skillet, drop them in with a little bit of oil and you get little popcorn kernel, uh, basically miniature little popcorns. Uh, but the other thing that you can do uh, and has been done is actually getting them to slightly germinate and they pop those seed coats off themselves, dry them and that can be converted into a flour. Um, I've been in talks with some folks from Shagbark uh, Mill here in town and we've been looking at ways that we can create better screens that are smaller to help us in the processing of that. Um, but I've actually, most of it that I've ever consumed of the wild variety, I use a coffee grinder and I put it on low and I pop them in and it pops the shells off for me and we're ready to go. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I guess I forget that I, not everyone can hear the questions. Other questions that folks have at that point in time. Sorry. Okay. So, so what we're looking at here then is a plant, as I mentioned, this plant, um, and where are the specimen samples? Oh, perfect. So, so again, looking at these. Oh, they're so torn up now. But so basically, if we take these, actually, if it were a little drier, just to show you here, since you asked, these are the seeds that we're talking about. So just little, look like little quinoas, yeah? Um, if, if I had dried this out a little bit, we would actually, if someone's kind of done it a little, it actually, usually you can beat it out and they'll pop right out of there and, and you're able to then process it. So these plants, as I mentioned, we see them popping up then as early in, in the Hocking Valley as about um, 3,200 to 3,600 years ago, in a period we refer to as the late archaic period. A few years back, uh, we excavated a site up, up in the Mundy Creek region, going towards Hawking Hills. Um, and it was a much older site. It was about 5,000 years old, the site that we excavated. Um, we didn't really know what we were getting into when we went to that site in particular. What was interesting is we did fi start finding houses at that site, which is not all that common for, for an archaeological site that is that old. Uh, the houses were different from these middle woodland houses that I've been talking about that are rectangular. These houses instead were circles, right? Circle structures are more temporary, right? You can throw a couple posts in the ground really quickly, throw some hides on them, um, and, and you, you're ready to go. This site most likely was used in the fall and people wintered over at that location. Uh, we found some very large pits that were full of nutshells, um, hickory, uh, there were some acorns, there were black walnut, butternut, all of the wonderful things that are available right now at this time of the year. And they were being processed in mass and, and then the nutshells were thrown into the fire and burnt. And so they were storing up meat for the nut meats for the winter that would help to get them through. What was interesting about this site is we also found a small hearth inside of one of those little circular houses. And hearths are great because people were all sloppy, right? Um, I guarantee you that if I go to your house probably at this time on your stovetop, if you cook at home, there's probably little residues of your food or inside of your oven there's residue of your food because we spill and we mess things up and we burn things. And burning is the most wonderful thing that any human can ever do because when you burn something, it pretty much preserves forever, right? It is, it's an archaeologist gold mine. Um, which I always tell people, if they're going to commit some horrible crime, don't burn the evidence. It'll be there forever, right? It's just <laughs> 2,000 years from now, right? But, um, but so what we found inside that little hearth was someone had some food. And inside of it, there were a number of these little seeds, right? A number of little quinopods at 5,000 years ago. Some of them had characteristics that were similar to what we see in these, cu oops, these cultivated or domesticated varieties. Unfortunately, the sample was too small for us to directly date to be able to absolutely say beyond a doubt that we have domesticated quinopods at 5,000 years ago. Uh, but if, but the, the evidence seems to appear that way. If we can, can confirm that through further analysis, uh, it would be the earliest evidence of this plant being domesticated anywhere, right? Right up there with, uh, rivaling with the domestication of quinoa in the Andes, uh, actually probably out, outstripping it of, it of its gold mine. So that would suggest then that not only is this food a native to our region, but that its earliest domestication happened here in southeastern Ohio, right? This really is, I think, in a lot of ways, our, um, 
the legacy of the, the people that lived here in a lot of ways, but it's, I think it is the closest we are going to get to a native crop uh, that can feed and, and restore some of our food systems as well as driving us forward uh, economically to help a lot of the farmers in the region who are looking for the next best thing. Quinoa itself, there's been a lot of talk of can we plant quinoa here? Can we grow quinoa here? Turns out it doesn't do well um, in temperatures that get above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And show me an Ohio summer in, in recent memory that didn't hit that temperature. It also doesn't do well with humidity. It actually will start to uh, spoil on the stock itself, if not germinate, or start to try to germinate on the stock, which is something you never want your plants to do, right? You don't want your seeds. Uh, breaking open and, 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 and going to germination before you can harvest them, uh, you end up with a whole host of bacteria and fungus that then cause for a lot of interesting health problems in humans. I think I'm probably, yeah, I'm getting kind of close there. Yeah? Uh, so all these weeds have all these wonderful properties to them, and you, you mentioned the process, and then you finally just went to some of the negatives, but <clears throat> if there's so many pluses out of, of a weed, why isn't General Motors or somebody capitalizing on it? That's a, that's a really great question. So the question is, why isn't, why isn't someone in, right, in, in big business kind of trying to capitalize on these things? I think a lot of it uh, has to do with uh, issues of existing infrastructure, for one, right? Uh, we are talking about if we were going to mass produce, let's say, this plant, which I think is possible, and I think we have plenty of supporting evidence to suggest that, um, we first need infrastructure that is uh, machinery and equipment for processing that's specialized to that. Uh, the other thing is that I think is really important to remember um, when it comes to food systems and particularly um, crop grains, uh, plant foods in particular, uh, you're looking at a very small handful of businesses that own pretty much, I think we're at a point now where three, three seed companies own about 65% of the world's seeds. Uh, that is to say that you have a system that exists and they're very focused particularly on corns, soybeans, these things that are, that are already there that can be ground up, sold and produced into food. That's market value being added to, to the crops themselves and a lot of money made off of that. Uh, and so, so I think there's that issue. But I think it also comes down to an issue of how we understand our own food system. Uh, I run through this activity with my students in my intro class every year. Um, where I ask them to keep a food journal for a day, write down everything they eat, right, for that one day. And they come in and, and we, we basically stand around and on the chalkboard, we start writing down, the, listing the foods. Not by, oh, I had a hamburger, but the source of that. Oh, well, you had some beef, right? So you had a cow, right? And then it's, oh, well, I had cheddar cheese on that hamburger. Okay, also a cow, right? I had some bread. Okay, there's our wheat. I had tortillo, there's your corn. And, and ultimately what ends up happening is for this classroom of about 100 students, we end up with about five meat sources, most of them four, it's mostly pigs, cows, chickens, and turkey, right? Uh, occasionally you'll get the occasional fish and I always ask them where it's coming from because I can't imagine wanting to eat fish from the hawking, which means it was frozen. And then we have to ask the question, is it breaded? And of course it ends up being fished with a side of wheat. But, but nonetheless, uh, very, very few sources of meat. And then when we start looking at the plants in their diet, it really is, it's corn, it's potato, it's wheat, what am I missing? Tomatoes, rice. rice. And that's usually where they're at, right? Five to six different plants. And we're talking about an enormous portion of their diet. And I would wager to bet that that's the case for probably just about everyone in this room. It's the things that we eat. And so when we're talking about introducing, yeah, these wonderful weeds into the diet or creating new cultivated lines of these weeds, as people did in the past, it's hard to find space in the diet to even move those in because we've become so focused on particular foods. Yeah? I mean, you see a lot of these like, food trends coming up, like you were talking about quinoa and all these other things, like farro and sure. all these different food trends, and a lot of it is driven by like, celebrity chefs and um, the New Nordic movement, and those are kind of going hand in hand. So is there yeah. like, access to like, talking to those people to implement it in their restaurants or getting it on that stage to then 
distribute it on a larger scale? Sure. So the question is, is there a way to, to get some of these foods introduced in with some of the celebrity chefs and see if they're, they would pick it up as an interest and, and, and work with it in that way and open up the scale? Yeah, I, one of the things I've been doing actually is I've, I've uh, travel to conferences. Uh, some of the conferences I've had out in the Southwest, uh, there's a lot of uh, First Peoples, American Indian tribes present. And so I have had conversations with some of their chefs because they have a real interest in this food. Um, and even, even meeting uh, here when, when some tribal leaders came to this area uh, a few years back, meeting with them about uh, the, the old foods that, that uh, their ancestors ate, there's a real interest in that. There is a real interest in that. Um, I had a, a gentleman chef, I was out at a conference in Tucson, and I was, I, I, I was talking about this particular plant, Kinopodium berlandieri, how we find it in the archaeological record, how it's, you know, this ancient prehistoric uh, Appalachian staple, essentially. I mean, pits with just thousands and thousands of these seeds. The, the pit, for example, at Ash Cave had over 9 million seeds stashed in it. This was a lot of seed. Uh, and the one thing that they always tell me is that they, they as they've tried to reintroduce some of the, the older cuisine and ancestral cuisine into their communities, that the, the, the only success they've ever found is when you douse it in butter, because everyone then loves it, right? And then you slowly cut back on the amount of butter you put into it. But I think, that, I think that's a great, great point. The more that we have recipes that are utilizing these foods and, and bringing that forward, I think the more successful we are in these conversations. Yeah, yeah. Has anybody tried to actually, you mentioned germination, to grow anything from these seeds that are 3,500 to 5,000 years old? So, so here's the problem with that. So most of them, it, it's a great question. Thank you. It's a great question. So the question is, uh, has anyone tried to grow um, any of the ancient seeds that we've recovered and see if we can get those to germinate? And most all of the, the seeds that we do have are actually what we call carbonized seeds. That is to say that they were exposed to fire. And so the, the germ is completely gone. The, the embryo inside is completely gone. Um, it's that fire that actually in a lot of cases preserves them. There are, however, dry rock shutters like Ash Cave uh, where all of those seeds, they were not carbonized. They were, they were essentially desiccated seeds. Uh, but they're so old uh, that the genetic material inside has broken down to the point where the plants just, they will not germinate, uh, so to speak. The, the seeds are dead at that point. Um, and, and there's been, I know, um, I know there's been some reports in the last few years if folks have, have seen some of this, for example, I think it was two years ago I saw this supposed claim that someone had found a 2,000-year-old gourd or squash and they had planted seeds and it had grown and, it, and they were trying to argue it was affiliated with this tribal group and yada, yada, yada. In actuality, it, it was affiliated with a tribal group. Um, what it was was some farmers had taken it off of, taking it from a reservation, they planted the seeds, and then they claimed it was a 2,000-year-old squash. Well, it was, because there, there's 2,000 years of history of growing that particular breed, but it wasn't a 2,000-year-old seed. However, the seed company, I think, probably made a lot of money when they were selling those seeds. So yeah, they, they're just too old to be able to germinate, and in, in many instances, the conditions in which we find them, they're carbonized and they're not even um, they're, they're not even in a, a state of freshness that you would expect uh, to them to be even capable of germinating. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the question, two questions. The first question, um, have I ever excavated um, a burial mound? And then the second question, um, whether we've ever put any of these seeds into um, the, the storage, seed storage up in, in Norway, right? Yeah. Um, so with respect to burial mound, um, those are sacred sites. There are hundreds of prehistoric burial mounds throughout or were hundreds, if not thousands, of prehistoric burial mounds throughout Athens County alone and throughout the Hocking River Valley, most of them are gone. Um, most of them have been destroyed for construction um, purposes. For example, there's a, there's a big apartment complex up on Richland Avenue. There were about three or four mounds up there that were removed um, and so that those construction pro developments could, could go forward. Um, the archaeological field school that, that I direct um, in its history it excavated one 
burial mound and that was located in the plains and it was because it was going to be demolitioned. It was going to be destroyed and so it was more of um, removing uh, the materials there as quickly as possible so that um, essentially uh, th they weren't lost or destroyed. Um, I try to, my, in, in my own professional ethics, in my own point of view, I try to avoid burials at all costs. Um, the information I get from them doesn't tell me a whole lot about how people were growing crops. It doesn't tell me about how they were building their houses. And I'm more interested in, in their day-to-day -day lives and trying to understand and retell that story and less interested in how they died. Um, uh, but there are archaeologists who have focused a lot on burials. Um, in fact, for the, the first early century of, of archaeology in America, almost the only thing that was ever excavated was burial mounds. And there was, a, there was an ongoing joke for a while in Kentucky that everyone went to Kentucky to die and get buried in a mound because no, they had ne they, no one had excavated any habitation sites, so no one knew the houses that they were living in. So the joke was, you go to Kentucky and die because there's no houses in Kentucky. Turns out, there's a lot of houses in Kentucky, but no one was focusing on that. Um, I, think, I think, honestly, um, I, I, I try to think about this from a, a, a perspective of if your ancestors, and, and I think a lot from the perspective of First People, these are their ancestors. And many people in this room probably have some degree of, of heritage, um, but certainly uh, I think we should all have a deep respect for the people that were here before uh, European conquest. Um, but I think that, I think, what would it be like to go dig up grandma, right? Um, or grandpa. And I would prefer to think that the most of us, if we could avoid doing that and we could actually honor those sacred spaces, this mound, some of them being pretty amazing and spectacular uh, national heritage sites, that we should try to do that, preserve them in perpetuity versus excavating them. Um, and then the, the second part of your question is, to my knowledge, no, none of these seeds have been placed into storage um, in Norway. Um, some of the quinoa varieties I know have um, from Bolivia and Peru, but otherwise, uh, certainly none of the ones that, uh, from, from the Appalachian region. Are we? I have 15 minutes? All right, excellent. 5.45. 5.45, all right, yeah. You talked a bit about food insecurity in the region. Yes. Absolutely. So the question is uh, talking about um, food insecurity in the region and the market price of quinoa and how would people be able to access and uh, because of the price of quinoa, is not a, it's not a cheap food, right? So, so my perspective on that is quinoa is the closest thing, closest analog we have, right? And so the price of quinoa is what we really should look at when we're talking about a native variety of, of this food. Uh, but I would also argue... I would, I, I would say that um, part of my, my thought process in that is absolutely, quinoa is not a cheap food. And if we were to cultivate, let's say, our native variety, as, as some folks have called it, our native quinoa, um, I would hope that it remains to not be a cheap food because the farming communities in this area uh, would benefit from the profits, uh, which means that there would be an economic stimulus, particularly to farmers, um, particularly, I would hope, to small organic farmers. Um, and that then builds a system of resilience that basically moves out into the community and helps to lift the economic system itself. Moving a whole lot of folks out of poverty and would be the long-term goal. And, and certainly, it's not the ultimate solution, but I think it's a piece to the puzzle. Other questions that folks have? Yeah. Sure. So, so different plants, they do it in different ways. Um, with, yeah, oh, sorry. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the question was, how did they do domestication? They didn't have a laboratory in which to look at, um, look at the seeds. They couldn't move genes around, uh, didn't necessarily have the same technologies that we have. So how did they go about doing this? And so with this particular genus of plant, Kinopodium, uh, the way that it works is uh, they're dimorphic in terms of their seeds. That is to say that on a wild plant, I can see this under, the, under a microscope, of course, they didn't have that advantage. Uh, it actually produces two different varieties of seeds. It produces a, a black, thick-seeded seed, the ones that we were talking about, and a small portion, about 1 to 2 percent of the seeds on that plant are actually very thin seed-coated. Okay? So there's already a built-in uh, 
population within, within the plant of seeds that are thin coated. So the question becomes, how do those become the dominant seeds on the plant? And that's where humans come in. Remember I mentioned in domestication, humans essentially play the major role in the reproduction, reproductive success of the plant or animal. In this case, what I think happened, and, and we're testing some hypotheses on these right now, I think what happened is those thick seeded, thick, thick coated seeds actually need the winter time. We call it stratification, uh, where they sit in the soil, they get wet, they freeze and they thaw, they freeze and they thaw, and it breaks the dormancy and allows them to germinate. I think people took these seeds and they threw them out in the spring. And when you throw them out in the spring, those thin seeded, thin coated seeds are going to germinate and the thick ones aren't, right? They're going to need another year uh, or, or, or that winter period. And so I think my hypothesis on this is that thinner uh, coated seeds produce more thinner coated seeds on the plant that grows from them. And so over a period of time of spring plantings, you're going to end up with plants then that are pretty much completely thin coated plants. They were very good observers, and, and I'll tell you that Ridgetop site where that has all of those wonderful tools being passed around, uh, that Ridgetop site, I actually have two storage pits that are side by side, and when we started measuring the seed coat thicknesses, you could tell the difference in the seeds based upon which pit they came from. They were both domesticated uh, caches of seed, but some of them all fell within like 10 and 20 microns in thickness and all and the other pit everything was under 10 microns which tells me just as quinoa has about 200 different varieties or cultivars these were probably two different cultivars and so they were practicing i i, I would postulate they were practicing a level of agrobiodiversity and actually keeping different varieties of the plant even so different crop varieties um, so they they were very good observers and they knew how to work within the mechanics uh, of propagation and cultivation. Yeah. Would you mind asking for your samples back? I just yes. Want to make sure yes, you certainly. I would. I would love that if folks could pass in this direction. Oh. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, there is at least one other. Someone does. There it is. Oh, that's it. All right, fantastic. So based on your archaeology, what do they eat? You had to describe what their diet looked like. I, I don't know, I guess, I guess I always thought they had corn, but what you're saying is corn was later. So if corn was later. 2,000 years, say, what did they actually eat? If we go back 2,000 years, these quinopods, this goosefoot, was their primary staple. There's little question of that. It's everywhere, and we find it, like I said, in these big caches. Uh, this marsh elder certainly was, was something. There's little seeds in here, as I illustrated there. There's also the things that, that, that we know that they were eating, like squash that we still have today, right? And there's also um, sunflowers would have been a component of the diet. In the spring, there was a plant called maygrass. We call it maygrass that grows in the American southeast now and up through the Gulf of Mexico. It would have been like a wheat, kind of like a wheat, um, that's very starchy, but it comes up early and you can harvest it in May. And so they probably were, were uh, collecting that and then growing it. But then also a lot of nuts, right? Hickory and walnut. Um, so, so certainly the diet in the past 2,000 years ago would have been composed of these things, plus meat of white-tailed deer, rabbit, turkey, all of those wonderful terrestrial animals that are around here today, and probably a lot of fish out of what would have then been a really clean river system, right? Yeah. So that's one of the great questions, right? I would, the one that we want to really get to and, and understand what the, I'm sorry? Oh, the question, the question, yes, thank you. Uh, so so how, how they prepared the food. The question was, how do, uh, is there any way to tell how they prepared the food? And yeah, there are inklings of that, right? Um, ideally, we would like, I would love someday for us to have a recipe book that we could put together that says, here's all of the things that people um, in the Allegheny Plateau of the Appalachian Mountains were, were eating, and here's, here's the cookbook. Um, we get some of that in rare instances. So occasionally we find what we call in archaeology a midden, or a tra it's a fancy way of saying a trash pit. Um, and just like we do, after dinner maybe, we scrape the plate, and if you don't throw it in the compost, you throw it in the trash, 
We get layers of that mixed together. And so in some instances, we're really lucky and deposition was quick enough that we can see those layers and start to pull things out of that and say, okay, all of these things are found together. These are likely um, the, you know, in a sense, kind of the recipe. We've seen this particularly, I've seen this in a couple instances um, with um, sumac, sumac berries. Uh, anyone walk around right now, there's these wonderful brownish red stalks on the on, on these smaller trees. That's a sumac tree. Those are edible. They have a real citrusy flavor to them. Um, they're actually really good. You can make lemonade and beverages out of them. But we find them oftentimes with fish bones, right? How many people pr uh, prepare salmon in here? Yeah? How many of you spray lemon or some kind of citrus on the salmon, right? Um, probably similar phenomenon. We also see um, some, some particular seeds and plants that are used in that have peppery flavors to them that often are in the context of that sumac with the fish. And so again, there's that pepper and that lemon. And so a recipe or a cuisine that's really comparable to what we eat today. But so we do have instances of that, but they're very hard uh, and very few. Uh, just because of the nature of the archaeological record. It's not just deposition, but then it's all the things that come along and mix that stuff up. It's all the, the agricultural plowing that destroys a lot of those archaeological materials and takes them out of context, and that certainly does uh, make that a, a much more difficult task. Any more questions? Uh, comment. Speaking of preparing food, I just want to thank you for letting me know burning dinner is actually a good thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, he said, he said he, he's, he's grateful that, that I've let him know that burning dinner is a, is a good thing, right? <laughs> it, it absolutely is. Um, and, 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 you know, my hope is that someday, about 2,000 years from now, there'll be people going around and, and digging up all of the, the uh, fire pits and the student backyards here so that we can have a wonderful understanding of what life was like in Athens here in 2017. <laughs> Any other questions? I greatly appreciate you, you joining me tonight and giving me the opportunity to speak with you, and thank you so much. Thank you.